When discussing topics such as deduction, detection, and crime fighting, as we do here on this channel, one name always stands out above the rest. A name that inevitably, for better or for worse, comes up. Sherlock Holmes. Is there a reason his name comes up so often? Is he an example worth imitating? Are there lessons to learn from his characterization? More than one, perhaps? These are the questions that I hope to answer in today's episode of Facts and Frauds. There is so much associated with the simple name Sherlock Holmes that it would be a nearly, if not impossible, task for one lone man to learn everything there is to know about the character. Sherlock Holmes, short of Jesus Christ and Dracula, has been portrayed more than any other person or character in history. Everything from Doyle's original stories and novels, to adaptations, spin-offs, one-offs, other non-canon novels and stories, plays, cartoons, games, TV shows from every era, remakes, and movies, just to name a few. Clearly, I can't be expected to cover every single one here on my channel without dedicating almost all of my time to the project. What I can do, though, is turn this into a multi-part event in Facts and Frauds, breaking up the subjects into different episodes, part one being entitled Sherlock Holmes according to the original Ca Doyle canon. This seems like the most logical place to start, and will also give us a nice foundation to compare the others to. Part two being Sherlock Holmes according to film, and then Sherlock Holmes according to television. I've also given some thought to dedicating another episode to the video game adaptations of Sherlock Holmes, and perhaps coming back at a later time to cover other adaptations, but for now, I'm going to try not to get overzealous. For today, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the stories written by Arthur Conan Doyle himself. In the year 1887, Arthur Conan Doyle was still a young physician, and he hoped to rewrite the world's approach to criminal detection. He created a fictional character based on his former medical professor, Joseph Bell, and he applied the scientific method to crime fighting, releasing the story that held the first appearance of Sherlock Holmes. What happened next surprised even Doyle, and set in motion events that would define the way we solve crime even down to our day today. Up until that point in time, the primary way to solve a crime with no witnesses was to either guess or beat a confession out of someone. The latter was preferred because it always got results even if the results were inaccurate. What made Sherlock Holmes so special then? Well, his use of the scientific method and the principle that nothing leaves this world without first leaving some trace of itself moved this character to look beyond the obvious to discern clues and come to conclusions, supported entirely by logic and science. Doyle didn't intend for Sherlock Holmes to become so popular and in fact expected people to lose interest in the character. But when people did not, he continued to publish more and more stories based on the character that fascinated the world. And now, these tried and tested methods that Bell and Doyle knew to be effective were not only confirmable, but also popularized. Of course, Doyle, Bell, and Holmes are not the only ones we have to thank for the advances in detective work. Fast forward to the year 1888, and the police of Scotland Yard would be faced with a criminal that would literally prove to be too much for the primitive methods of the time. The Whitechapel Murders, or better known as the Jack the Ripper Murders. There were rarely any reliable eyewitness testimonies, and the evidence found at the crime scenes never led to anything solid or concrete. The criminal stayed in the shadows and avoided the police at every turn, sometimes just by mere moments. It became increasingly clear that their methods at the time were outdated, especially as copycat crimes began to take after the Ripper murders. It's not really a surprise that some at the time even attempted to employ the methods found in Doyle's works to catch the Ripper. Unfortunately, at the time, these methods were underutilized and underdeveloped. It is widely considered that if the methods we use today were used at the time of Jack the Ripper, he would have been caught at a relatively early stage. So why are these Holmesian methods so compelling? Why are they worth our attention? Simply put, they worked when utilized properly. 
prior to Holmes, we have Joseph Bell and Doyle himself as examples for us that prove to us that these methods not only exist, but worked. Maybe not flawlessly, but they were created ahead of their time, and in some ways, they still are today. Where many people rely on technology when answers might be lying right beneath their eyes. The simplicity of it is what makes it so brilliant and then take into consideration that deduction itself is a skill applicable to almost any field of study, research, or career you can imagine. Sherlock Holmes proceeds to reveal to us in those stories that a relatively simple, albeit hard to master mindset, is capable of solving almost any issue or problem. Now you would be correct in challenging that Sherlock Holmes was a fictional character, and yes, some of his stories are pretty outlandish, sometimes even contradictory, to one of Sherlock's own principal rules in which he states that the simplest answer is usually the right one. True, in many of Sherlock Holmes' stories, the answer isn't exactly simple, but in principle, even with a few fumbles here and there, the reasoning of Sherlock Holmes according to those original novels and stories is rarely in question. A big reason for this is in fact because Doyle himself used deduction and knew how the reasoning backwards worked, and thus the application of them would be sound in most instances. One thing that sets the books apart from many adaptations today is that the books are far less dramatized than other adaptations, which also proves to make them more reliable. The books also lay to rest a common misconception about Sherlock Holmes. Many people think of Sherlock Holmes or portray him as cold, calculating machine. But more than a few times in the novels and short stories, we actually see Sherlock Holmes reflect on matters of emotion, human nature, and morality, proving a few things. Firstly, that such powers of observation, backwards reasoning, critical thinking, and deductive reasoning do not come from a mind of pure logic, but because the user is capable of controlling other factors, not allowing them to bias his or her opinion. Secondly, we learn that you don't have to be a machine to learn this skill, as many believe. Sherlock Holmes himself wasn't that way. Doyle wasn't, and neither was Bell. In fact, the greatest lesson we learn from Sherlock Holmes are the ones we seldom hear talked about in relation to his character. Many people talk about Sherlock Holmes' arrogance, but in reality, he was humble in defeat, or when taking a misstep. They talk about his flawless reasoning and calculating mind but forget he had a moral compass and a heart. Gone are flashy deductions, but instead we see quiet observation and deep mindful thought, concentration and critical thinking. People get caught up in the imagery of Sherlock Holmes, but forget he was far more lifelike than media has made him seem. So much so that people thought, and indeed still think on occasion, that he was a real human being living in a humble 221B Baker Street flat. So in conclusion, what do we take away from the original novels? Doyle's emphasis wasn't solely on making an interesting and entertaining character, but rather on revealing the true power of critical thinking, a skill that anyone, not just a high-functioning sociopath, can learn.